Sit on the couch. All right. It's like the view or something, right? Whoopi's going to come out in a minute. <laughs> uh, it's great to be with you in person. Yeah, it's it it doesn't a- happen that often. Most of the times we speak is on, on television by remote. And yeah. You're usually out on the West Coast, and I'm somewhere on the East Coast. It's good to see everybody on a day where, boy, do we have a lot to talk about. Um, I want to start there. It's sort of unavoidable to react, to have you react to the CPI print today because it is the news of the day. As all of you know, the markets are are sharply lower as a result of all of that. Uh, Just give me your view. Were were you surprised when you saw it? Just talk to me. I thought I was surprised that the core rate went up uh, the way it did. Uh, Everything was uh, stronger than expected, I think, except for gasoline prices, which were negative. And there was a lot of hope that uh, the gasoline price decline would offset the increases in other areas, but obviously that didn't happen. So, you know, the, the Fed is uh, clearly in play again. I know now people are talking about 100 basis points. Yeah, 40, really, 40%. Market's pricing in that 40%. Nomura says 100. What does Gunlock say? 75, I, I think. I mean, you, you can't... I've all, I'm always talking about how the Fed needs to s- stop oversteering. They, 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 they start too late, and then they have to catch up, and then they just keep going until finally... The, you know, I call it Mr. Magoo. They're driving, they're nearsighted, and they, they basically crashed into a dumpster or a tree or something. And that's what's kind of happening. But when you glue together some of the data and what the bond market has been saying, the only thing that makes sense to me is that the inflation rate is going to come down because of the Fed's aggressive activity. But what's the strangest thing, I call it the chart of the, it might be the chart of the, of the year, if not certainly of the month, is the predictions on the CPI going forward. So the CPI was supposed to be transitory, right? They tried to get it up to about 4% or so, is what I think they really were trying to do. And when it got to 4%, well, then it went to 5%. It was going to be transitory. And so they were kind of slow to do things. And it went straight up to to 9.1 on the headline at the peak. And if you look at the predictions of median economists, consensus economists, and if you look at market pricing, uh, basically, it says that inflation is going to go exactly it go, go down almost exactly as fast as it went up. And if you look at the chart, it says inflation per these forecasters is going to go to two percent, and it goes, so rapid decline from nine to two, and then starting in April or May of next year, then just go dead sideways like a total L-shaped thing. That is the dumbest forecast you can possibly imagine because it's completely. Uh, out of context of any historical experience. So what I think people are, are sort of worrying about in the bond market and starting to show up in the inversion and everything is that just as the inflation rate didn't stop at the four that they were hoping for, or the five maybe that they then were doubly hoping for, it overshot by 500 basis points, if inflation drops from nine to two very, very rapidly, why wouldn't you think it would overshoot to the downside? You know, as if inflation is going to be under control, nine down to two, and then just two. Actually, it's predicted to stay at two for like 18 months after that. If they overshot by about five percentage points on the upside, trying to get inflation from, say, one to four, so they, it overshot by much more than the amount they were hoping to get it to, they're trying to get it from nine to two. Well, if it overshoots by the same sort of percentage, we might get the CPI going to negative negative two, negative three. I'm not predicting this exactly, but it's much more logical to me that that would happen than you would just have it stop at two. And that's why people are actually not hating the long end of the Treasury bond market. Because it, but by normal comparisons, if there's an eight or nine inflation rate or a core inflation rate that's above six, who the heck wants a three and a quarter, 350, 30-year Treasury? And everybody knows that the inflation rate is calculated differently than it was back in Jimmy Carter's day. And so if you use the same uh, calculation technique as we used back then, inflation is is really more like 11 or 12 percent. Who wants bonds at 350 when inflation is so high and they're struggling to bring it down? Well, the only solution to that or the only thing that, that squares that circle is the bond market is predicting that we're going to get a very significant decline in inflation thanks to the Fed once again, I think, oversteering. I mean, I actually believe, I, I, before the inflation report today, I was of the opinion, very out of, very out of consensus, I was of the opinion that the Fed should not raise rates at all this month because it, there's accumulation, there's a lag on these things. Mm. And they've already raised rates by about 225, 250 basis points. 
And I, 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 say, I, I use a metaphor. It's kind of like the uh, Crown Royal whiskey ads that they used to show on the NFL games. You know, they would, they would try to act like they were a, a responsible uh, alcohol beverage company by saying, you know, hey, it's time for, to have a water. Remember that ad? They would have everybody have a water. So make every third drink a water. Well, maybe the Fed needs to have a water instead of another Crown Royal. But yeah. see, that, that speaks to what you might call a conundrum for the Fed is there is such a lag and nobody knows truly what the lag is. Nobody knows how long it's going to take for the hikes that they've already done to filter their way through the system. And it raises the issue of a policy mistake because they go yes. too strong, as, as you suggest, when maybe they shouldn't because they haven't waited long enough for what they've already done to work its way through the system. Right. But a, a lot, that's true. But, uh, but there are data points that you can look at. There are historical relationships. There's plenty of things that are different now, more suggestive of coming recession than when the Fed started back in the first quarter of this year. I mean, look at the leading economic indicators. They're worth watching, and on a year-over-year -year basis, it's 0.00. .00. And they were way, way up, thanks to all that stimulus from the last uh, year, year and two years ago. Look at uh, initial claims for unemployment. That's a good indicator. It's still very low, and the fact that it went from 3.5 to 3.7, okay, that's maybe statistical noise. But one, st one indicator that's really good for recession is the 12-month moving average of the uh, initial uh, employment claims when the weekly number crosses above the 12-month moving average, it's a very strong indication that a recession is likely to come. In fact, it's almost never wrong as an indicator. So that moving average is at 4.01 right now, and the unemployment, and, and it's at 3.7. Uh, I'm talking about the uh, unemployment rate here now. The unemployment rate is at 3.7. And so if it goes up to 4.1, that would be an, a, a recession indicator. So also, you know, consumer spending is, looks strong because of inflation. It's not really that strong on a real basis. So there's, there's a number of things that are, are saying that recession is uh, closer. I mean, we talked earlier this year a couple of times, and I said, I don't see a recession in 2022. That's right. But it certainly looks like 2023 you're looking at a recession uh, on these indicators if the, if the trends continue. Of course, let's not forget the, the granddaddy of them all, the yield curve. Two's tens. I mean, the two-year Treasury is up a lot today. 375 it, 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 you know, was the last that I saw. Yeah, I think it's 376 now, so close enough. But the, 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 that rate is up 75 basis points since the last Fed meeting. I mean, it doesn't feel like it, right? Because we've, the, the long end has been relatively stable, but the short end has been going up. So two's tens is inverted. If it gets to 50 and we're not there yet, that's a very strong recession indicator, twos, twos, tens at negative 50. And fives, thirties, thanks to today, it had been uh, not inverted in recent weeks. It was a few months ago, but now that's re-inverted too. So it's really starting to pile up on, on the recession side. And obviously consumers are having trouble. But suddenly debit card buying is drying up and it's turning into credit card buying. Mm -hmm. Once you get into a situation where you're buying gasoline, and food on credit cards, you're in an economic tractor pull situation, right? Every month it just gets harder because mm -hmm. you have the same problem with not being able to afford your groceries, but now you have to pay the interest on the credit card as well. So all these things are piling up. I, I think the chance of recession 2023 is, is really quite high. So you, you said you think they'll do 75. Yeah. Um, if you were the Fed chair, though, it sounds like you would do nothing. Uh, thanks to the thing today, I might do 25. Uh, if you, we had this interview yesterday, I would have said do nothing. But, you know, I think you do it, I would do 25. Because they haven't waited long enough to see what the impact of the, the hikes that they've already done yeah. right. are going to have. Right. It's oversteering. It, it's, it's very difficult in the investment business. A lot of people, they, they're so used to sort of certain cycles of life, you know, like a, a day, a week, a month. And they want markets and the economy to, to show that same type of predictive uh, cycles, but they take forever. When, when we spoke over the phone, when they started spraying all that money around, and I can't even remember, was it the two trillion was the first amount of money in the CARES Act, whatever it was? I was against it. And you were saying, well, desperate times uh, require desperate measures. Right. I said, yeah, I guess. But this is going to have very substantial ramifications with a delay. It, doesn't, it, it took about 18 months for those ramifications to show up with, uh-oh, look at this inflation rate. So right now, I, I think we're, we're, we, we, we have to more fully appreciate 
that we've already raised rates, kind of the amount that we raised them in 1994 that caused you know, the, the, the peaking of yields. And the bond market is starting to really show signs of uh, recession coming. I mean, I actually, for the first time in a long, long time, I bought a bu quite a lot of uh, long-term treasuries last week mm. because I, I'm observing that as the, as the short end is getting killed, the long end, I mean, there was a moment today that the 30-year treasury was up in price and down in yield, and it's only, it's only up in yield like a basis point whereas the, 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 the two years off about 25. When the long end starts rallying as, as the short end is selling off, that's a really powerful indication. See, now, I'm remembering a conversation we had most recently where you said that Powell had gotten his credibility back, right? That he's finally painting, right? You said he needs to, he needs to get on the ladder. Paint or get off paint the ladder. Paint or get off the ladder, yeah. right? And you said he was finally painting, that he got his credibility back. Now I wonder what happens if next week they do 25 if people say, see, he's talking tough, but he doesn't have the wherewithal to go through with the hikes that are necessary, and then he thinks they damage the credibility. How do you see that? The problem is that he is so volatile in his messaging. And so he didn't want to be called a wimp. He didn't want to be called an Arthur Burns. And so he, you know, he pumped a bunch of steel into his spine at Jackson Hole and gave eight minutes of Titan, 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 Titan. So he now, invoked Volcker at, at yeah, the same time. Yeah, yeah. And so... He's, he's, he, that was another oversteer <laughs> in the messaging. He, he went too far, I think, at Jackson Hole. And so now he's painting himself, talk about painting, he's <laughs> painting himself into a corner. He, he got off the ladder and painted himself into a corner. So now he's, uh, he's stuck. He has to do this. Um, but, yeah, it, it's, it's classic. The, the Fed almost always uh, over-tightens. And yet, Jay Powell sort of suggests with his rhetoric that he almost wants to over-tighten because he really wants that inflation rate to come plummeting down. And as I said uh, earlier, the economists and the market pricing are, are corroborating that idea. But the problem with that idea, I'm going to repeat it, because I think it's the most important concept. Why do you think it's going to stop at 2? If it goes from 9 to 2 in 8 months, why is it going to stop at 2? Is, is there some, some magical thing down there? Well, I always thought that he'd, he, he would rather, as you say, go too far than do too little right. and fix it on the other side if they go a little too far. Right. So it's another oversteer. So we're talking about another oversteer. So, so we're going to bring in a deflationary experience potentially, which is shocking to a lot of people. But if he really does what he's saying he's going to do, there's a fair shot that CPI goes negative after, if, if, indeed, it, if indeed it goes through to, down to 2%, it's going negative. And that's what the bond market is telling you. So it's really interesting that... Uh, that the situation has, has changed so remarkably in the past year. Can you believe that one year ago the two-year Treasury yielded 15 basis points, and now it's at 375? So uh, there's a lot of uh, dislocations that are going on. You know, when, when, you, when you do massive amounts of stimulus, it's going to, it's, you're going to have all kinds of, of shocks to the system. It's kind of like I, I was out on my patio uh, several months ago, and I caught my toe on like a, a rug that was flipped, and I fell down on my hip on the stone. And it hurt like hell the next day, that hip. But the strangest thing was two days later, it was my other hip that really was painful because you're, you're trying to you adjust. You overcompensated. Right? And that's the, way, that's the way all the economic data is. You had this huge spike up in consumer spending and, and the deficit and, and everything, and now we had the, the reversal of that. And... I, I think it's almost fully reversed, but we're still we're still kind of fighting we're fighting the after effects, which is the the lingering inflation rate, and it's it's going to be a bad economic environment. So you think that he, to use your metaphor at the beginning, he drives into a dumpster ultimately? Yeah, he he, he almost seems to want to. If you listen to Jackson Hole, well, maybe they need to. What what would you how would you respond to that to say it's the only yeah. thing that they're willing to tolerate? A yeah, uh, soft-ish landing or a mild recession to do what needs to be done. What, what's wrong with that scenario? That it, it's probably not going to be mild. Uh, it, it could be mild if they stopped somewhere around this rate. But if you, if you tack on another 150 basis points, I don't think it's going to be mild. I mean, wh what is supposed to be driving the economy? Housing is outrageously unaffordable compared to where it was two years ago. Do you know that thanks to... And, and that's without the rate increase... The mortgage rate's now up to, uh, I think the 30-year uh, mortgage rate is about six and a quarter now. 
it was six. It used to be down in the twos. So when you take uh, the accumulation of the price increases, this Case-Shiller uh, home price index nationwide is up 40% over the last 24 months, and mortgage rates are doubled. The effect of that is the, uh, the payment, the average payment for like a medium-priced home, mortgage payment, is up from $1,000 two years ago to $1,800 today. That's an 80% increase. I mean, that's completely non-affordable. So housing isn't going to bail you out. How about durable goods spending? Forget it. Everybody bought their durables during the, during the lockdowns. Everybody built their deck. You know, there were no microwaves. You couldn't, get a, you couldn't get a dishwasher. Now there's dishwashers all over the place because the inventories were overstocked in those areas. So where's it supposed to come from? The consumers, you know, they're, the gas prices are down a little bit, but they're still up 50% uh, from where they were uh, 18 months ago. Where's, where's the wherewithal to be, to, to, for, to be driving the economy? I just, I just don't see it. So, uh, boy, you, you raise rates much further, and uh, I, I think you're going to see substantially slower economy. And I don't mean, I don't mean the soft-ish. I mean the real thing. That's what's going to take to get inflation to go from 9 to 2. You're not, you can't do that with ne negative 1% GDP for a year. It's well, going to do more than that. What if they're okay with inflation not going to 2 they haven't said that, and they won't come out and say that. But what if they're really satisfied, if Powell is satisfied with, say, yeah, if you get it down to three or four, we can live with that, and maybe that's an easier goal to achieve without producing the kind of damage you suggest they'll do if they go down to two? That sounds like a reasonable secret plan to me. I mean, I, I, I think that's a better idea than going to two, than saying you have to go to two. It's just, it's just, it's just another... These shocks have these ramifications, and you, 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 you're just, I always use it oversteering. They're always oversteering. They need to slow down on these rate hikes. If you want to throw in one, one more, I mean, it shouldn't be 75. It probably will be, but I, I think you've got, you've got to uh, step back and see what the impact is as you move forward a few months, particularly in the context of this deteriorating economic data. So you bought long-term treasuries last week, yeah. um, you said. That now, the whole argument about there is no alternative to stocks has been dead now for a while. I want to talk about that because this is really important. I, I have a webcast that I do uh, first week of the year, first full business week. It's called Just Markets. And for the last two years, I talked about when you look at the valuation of the S&P 500, particularly in January of this year, compared to historical metrics, it was about the most overvalued in history. And I'm talking about... P.E. ratio, Schiller's Cape ratio, price to book. I mean, there's about 30 of these things you can look at. And almost all of them were in the top percentile or top three percentile of most overvalued in history. And I would lay this out and then throw in the, the shocker, the punchline, that as far overvalued as the S&P 500 was, it was cheap to bonds. It was actually cheap to bonds, as overvalued as it was. That has completely shifted. Because interest rates are up on the, if you take a look at the standard bond index, the Bloomberg Barclays Aggregate Index, the yield starting this year was one. It's now four and a quarter. It's up 325 basis points. The spreads on junk bonds are, have widened out, then narrowed in, now widening out again. The triple C category of junk bonds, I think today probably is 1,000 basis points over treasuries, which is the official uh, industry definition of distressed. So you can put together a bond portfolio. It, it will be risky because you're going to have to buy double B, triple B uh, types of things. But you can put a bond to portfolio together today that yields very easily 12%. Very easily. And these are bonds that used to be at, a, at prices of 100, and now they're at prices of 60 to 70 in some cases. Now, they're risky, okay? So they're going to have stock-like risk in terms of expected volatility. But these sectors are down so much. I mean, year to date, I've got my cheat sheet here. This doesn't even include today. Year to date, high yield bonds through today are, are down 13%. Investment grade corporate bonds are down 19%. 19. That's just because of the interest rate risk. Emerging market bonds are down over 20%. So these are, these are things that have a lot of risk, but there are prices that are substantially discounted because of interest rate risk. So you look at something as, as simple as bank loans, which is the top of the capital structure, the floating rates, so you don't have to worry about interest rate risk. They, they usually live, and I'm talking about the, the best ones, AAA. They're not going to take a loss. They've went from a price of 100 down to a price uh, earlier, a few a couple months ago, of 94, 
and now they're at about 96. These are securities that are very likely to go back to 100. So not only do you have a yield, because you're getting a spread above short-term interest rates, which are, which are going up to 3%, you're getting a yield of 5 or 6% with almost no risk. And the propensity of those bonds to go back to par is extremely high. So there's a, there's a forward return, say, one year, that could be 10, 11, 12%. And there's far, far less risk there than stocks. I, I think a very optimistic case on, on, on stocks would be a return of 12 to 15% over the next year. I mean, it's, there's the old phrase that Marty Zweig, the great Marty Zweig, who predicted the crash of 87 about two years earlier, he had a phrase, don't fight the Fed. Well, the Fed is still on the ladder, painting pretty hard. And, there, and don't forget, QT starts right now. That's right. Right Double. now. So don't, don't forget that it's not just the short-term rates that are creating a, a, an economic headwind. The, the QT is, is coming on strong, too. And back last time, in 2018, when Jay said he was on autopilot, uh, raising rates and doing QT, the most embarrassing statement ever made by a Fed chairman in my 40-year career because he had to reverse from autopilot to slashing rates in about six weeks. That's mm -hmm. because the stock market went into a free fall. And that's what we're looking at in terms of this cocktail. Well, that's what I, I spoke with uh, Scott Minard of Guggenheim last week who suggested that stocks were going to go into a free fall, down 20% by mid-October. And that would, that would cause a credit issue, which would yeah. bring the Fed back in. It would reintroduce this notion of the Fed put. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Largely. I mean, the, the, the action of the credit market is consistent with economic weakness and, and stock market trouble. My, my target on the S&P, I've been relatively neutral on the S&P, as you know, for about the last six months, but I, I think you have to start becoming more bearish. Uh, I've been looking ultimately for a target of 3,000 on the S&P, and we're at about 3,900 or so. So that's about a 20, 25% decline. I, th I think that's right. I, I don't know if it has, has to happen by mid-October, but heck, October is off, often a strange month. Kind of ominous. For, for, uh, uh, for negativity, yeah. Let me switch gears for a moment because, you know, as you, as you may know, the, the audience here, uh, there are, are a lot of financial advisors, uh, many of whom are, you know, mid-30s in age. Uh, they're trying to, trying to get their chops right. They have days like this. They got their clients calling them. Uh, and they're trying to figure out where the best places to be within the markets are. Um, I'm guessing that because of the, the more youthful age, as we want to put it, uh, they're thinking about crypto and they're thinking about that kind of stuff as, as an asset class that investors should be in going forward. If someone asks you, should investors be in crypto as a legitimate asset class, what do you say? I think you buy crypto when they, when they do free money again. When the, if the recession comes, if Jay's doing what he's doing, we're going to go back to free money. And Bitcoin basically got to 60000 on free money. And now that there's no free money, Bitcoin can't, basically can't get out of its own way. It's not really falling, but it, it could very well fall if stocks uh, do that 20% down. So I would dirt, certainly not be a buyer today. But uh, I, I think the Pavlovian, the, the best Pavlovian uh, connection is if they announce another money giveaway, you should buy, buy risk assets, including Bitcoin. But I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't buy it now. But you think it's going to be a while before? I mean, you have to have a, a series of events right. uh, that would even bring the Fed back in. So it sounds right. like it would be a while. You, you, you need a true Fed pivot, not, not the dreams of a Fed pivot that are still out there. I mean, the market still thinks the Fed's going to be pivoting in, in the second quarter of next year. I mean, maybe they will. Maybe the market's actually right because they, they might, they might over-tighten to an extent that wasn't, wasn't forecast earlier. But, you know, I, I like, I like this, this mix particularly. I, I think there's a really good opportunity. You, you buy this sort of 12% bond portfolio. That's just the yield. It could very easily have a higher return than that. Buy long-term treasuries because that now is the, the, the deflation risk, in spite of the fact that the narrative today is exactly the opposite, the mm -hmm. deflation risk is much higher today than it's been for the past two years. Um, and I'm not talking about next month. I'm talking about sometime later uh, next year, or certainly in 2023. And then, you know, you, you, see, you always want to own certain stocks, but I, I'd be a little, I, I'm still a little uh, on the lighter side. Do you own, you own stocks? Yeah, sure, of course. I always, you always own some, some of the What everything. do you own? I own European stocks uh, more than U.S. stocks, which have outperformed. And I just do it on like a, a basket basis. I'm not really a stock picker very much. And the biggest opportunity that's coming, I've been talking about this for years. Emerging markets? Is emerging markets. You Absolutely. haven't bought that yet? Nope. 
Nope. And I'm not going to buy emerging markets until, until the dollar breaks below its 200-day moving average. And when it does, you want to be, you want to be in big. Because emerging markets are really, really cheap. And I'm not talking about China. I, I have no opinion on China. I think that the no tensions... No opinion? You have an opinion on everything. No. The t China, China has... Uh, the data is unreliable, and the tensions are just getting to the point where I don't think it's safe to be long anything in China. Because mm. they might just not... They just m might confiscate it if things get, things get bad enough. So See, I, knew just, an, I knew you had an opinion I, I, I on China. Like, I like India. I, I like uh, Asia generally. And, and if you really want to go for it, you could go to South America. Uh, forget about Venezuela and, and, and so on. But, uh, you know, you're, you're fine in Chile and, and Brazil, I think. Let me um, ask you finally about your Buffalo Bills, your beloved Bills, who yeah. certainly look good in the opener. Yeah, they do. And, and there is a, a question uh, from somebody in the, in the audience who's, who's joined uh, who wants to know if the Bills will win the Super Bowl? Well, how do I know? I mean, I hope so, and I certainly have. A, they're certainly the, the, the odds-on favorite. But we've lived through wide right, the forward lateral, 13 mm. seconds, burn it all, burn it all. We win the Super Bowl, we burn it all, and that's what we want. To, that's what we want to happen. Do you have you have aspirations for NFL ownership if you couldn't do the Bills? No, n not at all. I, I I did play around with the Bills in 2014 when they were for sale. But the idea was to make sure they stayed in Buffalo. But Terry Pagula uh, kept them in Buffalo, and that's, that's really all I cared about. I mean, if, if the Bills left Buffalo, there would be a lot of broken people in the city. There are a lot of people that basically their lives revolve around, you know, feeling part of that community and part of that team. It's, it's a family. And if you, Von Miller, when he went to the Bills, he just said... He said, I've been in a lot of fan bases, you know, the Broncos have a great fan base and uh, so forth, but it's just different here. It's just different. But if you, if you, if you, if you can go to a Bills game, you should. And uh, it's, a, it's pretty wild. You know, for years, they didn't allow uh, night games in Buffalo because there was a Monday night football game where there was... They, they, the problem with the, the late games in Buffalo is the fan base starts tailgating at like 7 a.m. <laughs> yeah. And so by the time you get to midnight, which back then, that's when Monday Night Football went to. Right. It started later. These people are pretty lit up. Is that when they start jumping on the tables? No, the tables were after that. But they actually started turning. They were turning cars over oh. was the problem. All right. And that's kind of that, – that, and so they kind of got rid of that. So I think they substituted the tables for that. And, Probably uh, safer. These table people are unbelievable. They jump off the top of an RV. I, I, I haven't heard of any major injuries, but I can't imagine that there haven't been any. Thank you so much. This is Jeffrey Gunlock, uh, Thank folks. Thank you. Appreciate your time.